Our next guest, though, actually likes the Japanese banks, and it's not just all about Warren Buffett. Keith Fitzgerald is principal of Fitzgerald Group, and he's joining us now. Keith, thanks so much for being here. So you like the Japanese banks, and we were talking a little bit in the break. It's not just about the, the, the cash that they're sitting on. So can you elucidate a little bit for the punters that are watching right now? Oh, I'd be happy to. And if I, funny enough, you highlighted one of my favorite stocks, Mitsubishi Financial Group, MUFG. You know, the thing here in the past, people would have fled the dollars at weekends as a safety play. But I think the game is shifting. And this is why the Japanese banks in particular are key. They're central to the big trading groups. The trading groups are realigning into the Asian rim and towards China in particular. I think there's some serious profit potential ahead. When you say uh, there is serious potential, I mean, I'm looking at uh, the 12-month performance uh, for some of these names, 20% uh, plus, how much more to go? You know, that's a tough call because, you know, the, it, we live in a very challenging world. Obviously, the Federal Reserve has still got some tricks up its sleeve. The EU has still got some shenanigans to play. So it's very hard to put a number, but I think 5 7 even on the outside, 8 or 9% year over year would be good. Hmm. Uh, what stands out in terms of the return ratios and the quality of the book for some of these Japanese financials uh, compared to the rest of the region? You know, I like the fact that they're sitting on large amounts of cash in particular because what they've done is, you know, the Japanese are notoriously cautious, they're prudent, and in fact, you know, sometimes that works against them in the high growth environment, but it works for them when you've got a shift in sea change, which is exactly what we're dealing with now. The potential to go from one currency to another is something that they'll respond naturally to because of the way they're structured in the trading companies, the way they're interrelated, inter interlocking ownership, those are all things that are going to play well for the Japanese financials. Would you paint all of them with the same brush? Because I'm looking at the year-to-date performance and Mizuhu Financial tops the list with a 7% gain, followed by, of course, uh, uh, SMFG and then uh, MUFG. So, so would you go in that pecking order? No, I wouldn't. And, you know, again, I, having had 30, coming up on 35 years in Japan, working in the area, living in there part-time at least, um, I think Mitsubishi Financial Group is the one I want to go with because I think the direct dynamic trading company business is a lot bigger, a lot more solid, and has a lot more upside. So to me, that's where I'm going to go. I'm willing to wait it out, be a little patient. You, you mentioned prudence of the Japanese banks, but I wanted to mention what perhaps isn't as prudent because what's been happening with the, the debt ceiling right now and this gamesmanship, we're, we're hitting Asia time tonight, but your side tomorrow for those discussions do you think that they're going to come to any kind of reasonable resolution because you know depending on who you ask the fear is that we are going to see a similar kind of impasse that we did see in 2011 and even if it does get resolved we could see a little bit of market pain coming through on the back end of it well, but that's normal, too. Don't forget that the markets today are considerably different than they were even a decade ago. They're much more computerized, they're much more leveraged, and they're much more interrelated because of the use of options and warrants, particularly as risk is arbitraged around the world. So that makes for more volatility, even if there is an impasse. So I don't think the volatility is going to be unusual. I think it's going to be too expected. It's going to be a traveling companion and an opportunity. But, but in so much as it can be an opportunity, we're, all, we're already, in terms of... I don't want to necessarily say risk tolerance, but just the build-up of risk that has been amounting throughout the course of the first six months of, or first five months of this year, if we're going to be a little bit sticklers about it. But you've got the, the banking crisis that's ongoing. You've got CRE fees that are now prevalent in the market. We've got this debt ceiling. You've got this fear that, you know, the participation in the markets just isn't there because everyone's running to, you know, short-term money market accounts. Is it not the concern that it just takes one more thing to go wrong and then everything goes wrong? Is that not something that you're trying to position now in order to find some solace that you're not going to get burnt? Well, you know, of course, that's a relative term, right? I mean, we've been with our clients eight to 12 months ahead of this mess. So I'm not particularly concerned. I'm not losing sleep because this is something we've anticipated. The problem with most investors is that they live in the moment. What you've got to do is look beyond that. And we know, for example, that most investors do absolutely the right thing at precisely the wrong time. They sell when they should be buying. They buy when they should be selling. So if we look at the psychology right now, I think that's critical. We've got long equity positions here in the United States at just not nine percent of retail investors that is an amazingly bullish contrarian indicator when you look at how history has played out i see similar things in the japanese markets i see it in hong kong i see it in even in mainland china where it's data is harder to come by but psychology psychology the human condition is very interesting and an opportunity 
Right. Keith, do you think that the markets favor for long duration, as we are seeing with the 10-year benchmark uh, versus short duration, uh, is a sign that maybe uh, that, you know, the market is pricing that the worst is over? You know, that's a tough call. I, I'm in communication constantly with traders around the world, and, you know, that is very much the subject of, of our conversation. You know, is the worst behind us? And it's impossible to answer that. This is why I watch your show. You know, the thing that we've got to focus on as investors and traders is what we know from history. And we know from history that the world's best companies continue to put up good numbers. We're seeing that. And that human psychology lives on hope and aspiration. So we put those two things together. I think there's a compelling case that we are closer to the end of this mess and shenanigans than we were to the beginning of another shoe dropping. Keith, I've got to ask you, because you're suggesting in your notes that there is the potential, and I don't want to like lock you into anything, that Apple could hit 300 over the next 12 to 24 months. Are you not concerned that they're so heavily geared towards consumers, be it in the US, be it in China, that they're just not going to sell enough phones? <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese consumer is struggling. Well, if that were all I were concerned about, yes, I would be extremely worried, but I'm not, and here's why. It's the phone, and I have one in my hand right now, if the phone were just a phone, then yes, that would be a problem. But Apple has moved well beyond that. It's a sensory platform that combines services, payments, financial, medical data, all of those things. Apple could stop making iPhones tomorrow and still put billions of dollars on the top line over the next few years. So. People are using Apple, they're running to it. I'm not aware, despite inflationary worries and economic worries, of anybody who has given up an iPhone. In fact, customers are buying more of them. That speaks volumes about where the stock price is headed next. But how much of a good thing do you continue to buy? I mean, at some point in time, the compounding story kind of, compounding is different, you know, but, but, but being overbought is a real thing. I mean, you take NVIDIA, for example, 102% down year to date. I know that AI is, is very compelling. It's yet to be priced in. There's a premium attached to it. And all the innovation that's going out at, at NVIDIA uh, is, is game changing. But at some it point is. in time, yeah, but at some point in time, you, you would want to book profits, right? Because it's just like, it's just a vertical climb. And so it may fall eventually to rationalize valuations. Well, and that's a very sharp question. We deal with that one frequently. That's really a matter of tactics. You know, NVIDIA is one of our holdings, and I love the fact that it's run up 108% year to date. So here's the thing. You know, you can sell half to capture profits if you were in early. If you're buying now, you can dollar cost average in or volatility, value cost average in. That's going to harness volatility. So if your position is three, five, seven, ten years out, then there's no harm in nibbling in, even at high valuations, because the market wants to run higher. People are surprised surprised by this, but the market spend two thirds of their time at or within 10% of all time highs. That's how they work. Capital wants to grow. So if you're an investor, you can harness that, particularly with a company like NVIDIA. Mm. All right, Keith, we leave it at that. Thank you very much for stopping by and speaking with us. I really enjoyed Thanks. this conversation. Take care. So did I. Thank you very much. Hi, it's Keith here. Thanks for checking out today's highlight clip. What'd you think? Did I make sense? Is there something you'd like to add? Make sure you leave a comment down below and of course, click subscribe to keep up right here on YouTube or sign up for the email newsletter at the link below. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram for my real-time thoughts on markets, analysis, and a whole lot more.